working on this piece of furniture for a customer of mine, and it ended up being one of the pieces for me that I've gone way too far for the amount I'm charging on it. But that wasn't an accident. It wasn't me being stupid. It's just a lot of things that I do are very repetitious, and I'll get into a groove because I'll make the same thing over and over again for customers. And this sofa table is what this is going to be with a cherry top, a uh, cherry lower shelf, and then the base is made of pine, Douglas fir, poplar, and it's going to be um, painted black. And uh, for paint, I'm going to be using uh, some milk paint. And I could just spray it black with some, uh, you know, some black wall paint, but I'm doing some different... Uh, the whole purpose of me going too far on this piece is to use it as a learning experience, experimenting with different techniques, different finishes, and um, just some different ideas that have been tossed around in my head. So uh, this is going to be painted black using the milk paint, and so I wanted to show you some of the joints on it and some of the different uh, ways I went around solving some different problems, just in case you're looking to make something similar or just uh, it might inspire you in some way uh, in one of your next projects to um, use some of these elements. So let's take a closer look. One thing, and this may sound strange to a lot of you, but certain steps within this project I wanted to make a little more complicated than they needed to be just to do the uh, sort of the procedure required um, to make it work. One of them was tapering the legs. One of the easiest things to do when you're tapering legs is just to taper the two outside faces. It gives you the look of a tapered leg, but if you have any joinery connecting, any rails connecting to that leg like you do up here, this, uh, the shoulders on those tenons are 90 degrees to that rail. Um, I ended up doing four-sided tapers on these, so about a quarter of an inch, half inch below where this main rail connects into the leg, it starts to taper. It tapers from two inches down to about an inch and a quarter, I believe is what they are at the bottom. So what this required me to do is to have angled shoulders on the rails, um, on the angled shoulders on these rails where those tenons are that are the same angle as this taper. And uh, when it came to tapering the legs, uh, tapering legs is pretty simple. You can do it on many ways. The way I did it is on a table saw. The other way that I'll do it oftentimes is on a joiner and if you have a bandsaw you can cut the taper rough on the bandsaw and then smooth them up on the uh, on the joiner. I'm going to go ahead and clarify a little bit about how the tapering jig works for tapering the legs on this uh, sofa table I'm making um, and if you'd like to see a video, a longer video on how to make a simple jig like this or maybe a more elaborate version let me know in the comments below. Once again, this is just a pine board. It'd be best to use some sort of a, a more stable piece of plywood because as you can see, um, there's some wobble in that, which is gonna cause a little bit of burning on your um, uh, leg and uh, potential danger. But I only needed to use this once. I just still have it sitting around. Uh, I made it specifically for those legs just uh, to get a really quick solution. But uh, it's just a board with a piece on the back to back up the workpiece to make sure it doesn't move back on you and then the screw itself is what makes the adjustment for the taper combined with where you place the fence. You want to make sure that this piece on the back is um, sticking out far enough to support the variety of tapers you may cut um, according to how far you adjust this screw out. And when I said this screw is what the piece is up against, I don't mean like this, I mean actually on top of it to where it pushes the bottom of the, um, the element that you're tapering out or in far enough to get the desired taper. And uh, once again, it rides up against the fence. If you were to do something that would be a little more safer, you might want to have a piece um, that's vertical against the fence here, goes across and down the other side, which would keep it from doing any of this uh, type of movement, um, which would uh, cause burns into the leg or either kind of cut into it a little bit, it basically creates more cleanup. I was just extra careful and I was just cutting four legs, so um, I dealt with any problems that came up. So how you adjust it is, and we're going to pretend that this is the piece that we're going to taper. This is a taper uh, table leg. Normally you would want your jig to be a little longer than your um, piece that you're cutting the taper on, but in this case it's just a sample. So the piece goes on there like that, and you can see, I'm sure, there's that shadow line that shows the taper. Um, you want to move your fence 
to where you can see that the blade is going to enter in the point you want to make a mark and the blade will start the taper where you make your mark and then you can check it like this by checking the back side of the blade that it exits the point to create the right taper at the bottom. So then I'm going to lower the blade to sort of demo it. So you want your piece up against the top and then the bottom of it up against that screw and that screw you can adjust out. Mine's just a Phillips head um, bit so I can what I normally do is I'll make fine adjustments and get that first cut perfect and then go and th uh, go through and do all of them. And then on a four-sided taper you then have to readjust this screw by backing it farther out to compensate for the tapers that you cut off on your first two passes. So you would adjust that to whatever you need it to and then with the blade raised, table saw on, starting far enough back to where it's not touching the piece of wood, you would just make your pass through. And once again, this is a very simple version and not the easiest to use and it's in a way, I was pretty uncomfortable doing it, it was semi-dangerous to use so um, you want to probably make some sort of changes to this jig to make it a little easier to use. Perhaps that part that would ride over your fence. The other idea would be to have a piece up under here and then some sort of a toggle clamp on top to where you're not doing this big balancing act over top your blade. The other thing that's a downfall for me is I don't have an outfeed table. So you have the combined weight of your jig and your leg wanting to do this once you go far enough. So there's a lot of kind of firm pushing, which you want to have things firmly held in place, but anytime you're firmly pushing in the direction of your table saw blade, you really need to make sure that you have some sort of safety device in place, whether it be some sort of a blade guard, uh, perhaps at least a riving knife set up, or if you have some sort of kickback, but um, just, just be extra careful in that situation. Let's talk a little about this rail here, some of its shape, joinery, and how I got some of these angles. The rail at first when I started working on it was at its full dimension, which is about two inches. You don't want to do all your joinery and be cutting mortises when this is an odd shaped piece of wood. It'll make it a little more difficult to set up against fences and stop blocks or whatever it is you need to do. Um, so uh, this shape was cut into this after the fact. But the first step is just doing all your layout lines to where you know where all of your joinery is and all of your key positions for different elements to intersect in. I wanted this piece to be thick enough to have enough material to support the mortise that comes through it, I mean the tenon that comes through it. Uh, but the thing is, is with it being this thick and then placed beside a thinner leg, it would look kind of bulky. So this shape is what I did to solve that. It starts out more delicate, thinner at the rail, and goes up here, building up to a thickness with these curves. And that gives sort of a, I guess like I said, a more elegant look, but gives you that weight you need and that thickness to be able to support a tenon. And uh, this is a through tenon. These pieces of wood are poplar. I like it. It works great when it's um, going to be a painted piece of furniture. These were through mortises. This is a half inch. So this mortise... Uh, I mean, this tenon comes off of this piece through this piece. It's a half inch by half inch, and then it's going to have a pin that goes through um, through there to lock it in. It is glued. That pin will be added in after it is painted. So um, you get to sort of see the full look of this joint when I turn the camera here at an angle. You have this elevation that comes up to give you the thickness you need, and then this rail comes off and then also goes up to get to a bigger thickness, which gives support to the full length of this shelf, which is about 50, 54 inches long is I think what the shelf is. So I didn't want that shelf to sag, so I wanted to have make sure I had enough thickness in this rail. And um, in doing that, your shelf ends up coming and hanging off of this, and it gives a nice floating effect, which um, also gives it a little more airiness to where the whole piece doesn't look so blocky and solid. The next thing I want to talk about is this joint right here and how to achieve the uh, the angled shoulder. You do so by taking a bevel gauge, a T-bevel, and setting it to the angle between the apron and the leg where you've cut the taper on the tapering jig on the table saw or either on your joiner or however you achieved it. 
Then you want to take your, your uh, gauge and mark that angle on the leg at the right distances between this one and this one. Um, and it's best to do all this before you cut any shape into this rail. Then using my miter gauge on the table saw, I set it to the right angle from the miter gauge to the blade using my T-bevel and then set up a stop block of sorts um, on clamped to the fence that I could slide up against every time but not so much that not so close to the blade that once I slid forward it was still up against it which could cause some sort of a bind. I made sure it was placed about three inches back from the blade I would press against it and then slide off of it and then cut that tenon. Let's talk a little about the drawer in this piece. Like I said I ended up adding it because at first I felt that the broad apron was a good idea but after the fact it it added a little bit of bulkiness to it and plainness that I didn't like so I thought by adding the drawer and then it would be painted and then I'm gonna put a cherry knob on the front it would dress it up just enough but still keeping it in sort of that simple looking piece of furniture uh, appearance um, but the drawer itself goes in through a hole that was cut out in the apron instead of ripping these into pieces and then reassembling it. Um, I cut this out by drilling holes in the corners on the drill press and then very carefully cutting it out on the um, with a jigsaw and then I cleaned these up with a plane and then filed the corners um, even and just got it as straight as I can. The drawer front overlaps the face of it so if it is some minor discrepancies in the straightness of that cut they're not going to show up because the lip of the drawer covers it up. Um, if it was mo a flush mount drawer where it this face was flush with the apron, then I would perhaps take even more precaution. But even then, that is a straight enough line with what I did. The other thing you can do is come back in and bevel those corners slightly with a hand plane, and that really straightens out the appearance of it too, just by adding that straight line to perhaps a slightly wavy cut. The drawer itself is constructed out of a poplar frame with a pine bottom in it and then the corners are, um, are box joints or finger joints, whatever you want to call them, done on a table saw with a miter gauge. The drawer front is attached to the face of this using, um, it is just glued on but that's such a large glue service that that's plenty strong, then there'll be the added strength of a screw going through the face coming out through the front and that'll be what the knob is actually pulling on. The bottom of the drawer is put in through a raised panel of sorts. I used a dado stack to cut the um, cut a rabbit in the edge of the board and then flipped the drawer bottom up on the side of my table saw. I have a left tilt arbor on the table saw and and I just sort of knocked the corners off of it to give it a slightly raised panel um, sort of look and just take down on some of that thinness which makes it just a little nicer even though these people are probably never going to look at the bottom of the drawer but it's where I'm going to sign the piece I carve my initials into the bottom of all the pieces I make so if they were to look I want it to be you know to have a nice look as far as how this drawer is sitting in the piece of furniture, all I did was took some pieces of wood, the same dimensions as the apron, and I cut some stop dados that go down the insides of the apron, cut a rabbit on this piece, and that slides down and bottoms out on that dado. So you've got downward support, but then you've got an actual joint between the front and back aprons. That joint was further locked in with some little 45 degree glue blocks that I glued and then shot in with some brad nails with my nail gun. The drawer rides on these, um, I don't know what you call them, we'll just call them, uh, well, the drawer supports, whatever, it doesn't matter. They are some 3 quarter inch by 1 inch pieces of wood. They are as thick as this space is here, this bottom part of the apron. And then in the end those will get waxed up as will the sides and bottoms of the drawer which will make a very smooth riding drawer. The next thing you're going to need to do that some of you may be facing in, in some of your own projects is when you pull a drawer out it has the tendency to fall down like this. So you're going to need the same type of strips at the top um, allowing just a very very small amount of play to where if there is any swelling in the drawer in this direction 
it doesn't end up getting the locked in too tight. If it does in the future, some sort of light passes with the hand plane or sanding or further waxing can be done to um, adjust that fit. I want to very quickly talk a little bit about uh, the finger joints for the drawer and how I achieved it. It's a pretty simple way using the table saw and my miter gauge. For those of you who aren't familiar with finger joints, uh, they're also referred to as box joints. And um, this is the sample board. I mean, it's got this little funny pin on the end here, but this was just a sample board to get the right spacing to where they weren't too loose or too tight. But a finger joint is basically straight fingers. It's an interlocking joint, and it's just got uh, straight sides on each finger, unlike a dovetail that has angles. The dovetail is a little more interlocking, but um, really, I don't know the difference between strength, but when you think about it, you're getting more long grain glue surface on a finger joint versus when you are gluing together a dovetail, it is sort of half, uh, half in grain, half long grain, probably a little more long grain than in grain because it's an angle through the wood. But, um, you know, that's, that's being a little nitpicky. It, both are very strong joints. But when it's not super critical to use dovetails, um, this joint is more than strong for most applications. Um, how I achieved the joint is on my table saw with a miter gauge with a straight piece of wood clamp to it and then the actual jig part of the uh, device here clamped to this straight piece that's screwed to the miter gauge. And I won't go into the full detail of it, but basically it's using an indexing pin that has been spaced over far enough to uh, give you the right spacing for the, um, for the joint you're making. This piece of wood here is 3 eighths of an inch thick, the same thickness as the dado blade that you're going to be using. So you make your first cut by placing your piece of wood up against the pin, make your pass across the um, blade, and then you just move it over each time. And the hardest thing is, is you just want to make sure that you keep up with what's the top of your, the top edges of all your boards. Once I get to the end, I flip my piece around, you place the first, uh, first slot that you cut over that indexing pin, and then place the top edge of the next board against that, and then make your pass. And then from there you remove the first board you cut in, and then keep going. You can also cut both boards at the same time if you want by staggering them one finger joint. Um, I oftentimes end up just doing one at a time because when you get to the end, in some cases, you could end up with tear out on one of your fingers that where it's uh, staggered. So I just go one board at a time. Oftentimes I'm only doing finger joints and something about this wide, so it really isn't too much of a time saver to be worth the risk of um, something going wrong. One thing that I think plagues every woodworker, both uh, young, old, skilled, unskilled, beginner, advanced, is when you go to glue something up. You pretty much have to be a woodworking octopus to um, glue certain things up. Even a piece like this is relatively simple. It can be a little hectic because I'm using yellow wood glue. And uh, luckily, right now at least, it's a little cool, so the glue takes a little longer to set up. But in the summertime, when you're gluing stuff up, especially if you're not in some AC, your glue can really start setting up fast because your actual pieces of wood you're gluing uh, in addition just to the air temperature, it's all just too warm and it causes it to set up fast. With this piece, I have about 16 or 20 mortise and tenon joints also. And to apply glue to all those joints, get everything clamped up, make sure it's all squared up and nothing's uneven or glued in upside down, that can be a very hectic thing to get done in the amount of time you have. Um, Sometimes I'll glue things up deliberately when it's cold and then move them into a warmer environment to, to have a longer uh, working time. But when, it's, when this glue is setting up quick, I mean, in some cases you only have about 10 minutes or so before things start to really tack up and get difficult to work with. Um, so you'll want to make sure that you do dry runs, clamping things up, meaning clamping it all together with no glue. It can take a little bit of time but I've seen some disasters happen with some furniture projects that people spent so much time and, and money in addition to that with some of the uh, more expensive woods. In my case, I'm using mainly inexpensive woods. These pine boards that I'm using cost $1.50 a piece for an eight foot long one by six. Um, so, 
yes, I have time, but if I need to during the process, I can take my time working on it, remake a part if it's not right. But once you glue it all together, you can have a mess on your hands. So make sure you do proper labeling between your joints. Like when I use a combination of letters and numbers and arrows and X's and circles and shapes, all different types of things. Um, sort of a, you know, measure twice, cut once type mentality of uh, labeling my joints in several different directions, different lines that I know are supposed to line up. That way, um, sometimes I'll go through and I, I might have a, a, a corner that got labeled one and another one that's a one, and I'm like, well, you know, this isn't right, and trying to figure it out. Well, if you have more than one way that you've labeled the corner, little pieces of like blue painter's tape and stuff, uh, marking things left and right, plus ones and A's and B's and all that kind of stuff, you can really double and triple check yourself into making sure. The other thing I'll do is label things front and back and top and bottom and all that kind of stuff. Because a lot of pieces, um, this is relatively simple, but you're starting to get a lot of different pieces. The types of clamps I use are pipe clamps. These come from Harbor Freight, and then you know you get your pipes from wherever, plumbing supply, home centers, whatever. Um, I use a lot of Irwin clamps. I really like these. I think for, you know, they can be a little pricier, but I mean, for what you're doing with them, if you're, especially if you're a person doing things, making money with your woodworking, usually your tools are, you know, worth their weight in gold, and I really like these types of clamps. This, are, this is some of the bigger ones. I also have a lot of the six inch ones too. At one point, I think I had about 30 or 40 of them. I think slowly over time I've been breaking them and haven't been replacing them. But I've got a, four of these types of clamps, 24 inch ones and then 12 inch ones. Um, these have about 600 pounds of pressure and I use these a lot of times for clamping some of the lower things. They've got these nice big broad pads and um, then I use also band clamps to uh, do around my, between my legs and my aprons and uh, placing one at the top of the joint, one towards the lower part of the joint, and then if I need to, I'll tighten those joints in a little bit more with a pipe clamp. Um, and I know this video is probably getting a little long and a little detailed, but I'm really seeing this as more of an opportunity, I mean more of an opportunity than just to talk about this piece of furniture in general. I might start doing this type of video um, more often where I just show some of my projects, not a full how-to build, because that really is kind of limiting in a way. I still want to do things like that where I come up with projects for my subscribers in particular, but go over some of my projects that I'm doing for customers, either sort of things that I'm making over and over again or a more custom piece like this, uh, because then, then we'll get sort of into an ongoing conversation of furniture design, problem solving, and I think a video like that will be much more applicable because you can apply it to your project, different techniques apply to your project, instead of me just showing how to build something in particular, like this is how you make this chair, even though even a video like that, uh, the skills can be applied to so many more things than just the topic. But um, I think that pretty much wraps up a video talking about this particular thing. The only other thing I didn't talk about is the joint between the apron and the leg. That is just a simple mortise and tenon. Uh, it is the same uh, type of a joint that I demonstrate in my video cutting tenons. It's, I think it's, it, it's a video called um, uh, Tenons on the Table Saw or something. You can check my videos for that. I'll also probably put a link in the description and then perhaps a little video at the end of this that you can click on to get over to that. But uh, let me know what you think about the video. Um, if you like it, let me know what you like about it in the comments uh, below. Be sure to give it a thumbs up if you like this type of video. I'm really starting to try to kind of design my channel and develop certain uh, repeat type things. Uh, for example, the Craftsman's Corner video that I just uh, somewhat, somewhat recently did. I think it's getting a pretty good response and people are interested in it. And I think it'll only get better. And uh, perhaps videos like this. At first I was kind of planning on just having showing this a little bit be part of that Craftsman's Corner video just by filming um, filming little snippets of this and that throughout the month and then kind of putting it all together in sort of a choppy video at the end of the month and then from there people could just drill me with questions but um, this got a little more involved and it's given me more ideas so um, you know the channel of course is still in a very developing uh, stage 
So, uh, you know, your input is extremely important. So, uh, see me on Facebook, like this video, uh, thumbs up, subscribe, all the things, leave questions, comments, um, whatever you like. Please share my channel and my videos and my Facebook page with your friends. Uh, it'd be a big help. The channel's growing at a very um, pleasing rate to me, and um, each time I do something, I'm always surprised by the response. I've been getting messages, people thanking me for my channel and, and saying I'm inspiring them to do things and that really means a lot and it wasn't really expected. I just think it's fun doing the videos and showing projects and uh, chatting with people and it's kind of starting to turn into more than that even with the 2,500 or so subscribers that I have. So in maybe perhaps a couple years from now when I've got 10 times as many videos and, and tens of thousands of subscribers hopefully, I mean there's no telling where it might be. So uh, I uh, want to thank y'all just as much as you're thanking me. And uh, other than that, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. If you'd like to subscribe to my YouTube channel, click the red subscribe button on the screen. And if you'd like to see the jig that cuts tenons on the table saw, click the video playing now.